we are in a stronger position, we are moving in a better direction than when I took office. Since the age of 14, I've been stopped and frisked by NYPD police officers over 35 times. So, frisked me, um, patted me down. I've been stopped and frisked eight to nine times. And for them to be separated makes them different. I believe everybody's entitled to uh, the same benefits. Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Andrew Whitman in again tonight for Richard French. Want to thank you for joining us this Thursday evening, Flag Day, June 14th. We've got a lot to get to tonight. Up first, campaign mode Obama. President in full campaign mode today, making a major economic speech in Ohio. He is also visiting One World Trade Center in Manhattan right now. We're going to bring you there live in just a moment. And next, stop and frisk. Last night we heard about the impact of quotas on the NYPD. Tonight we're going to hear from a New York State Senator who's trying to outlaw such potentially damaging quotas. He'll tell us about his quest and why those quotas are in his mind driving up the number of stop and frisks. And later, Billie Jean King. I sat down with the tennis legend to talk about everything from ligaments to labor unions. And then... Hero or homicide? A man who found his daughter being molested beat the alleged sexual predator to death. That father hasn't been charged with anything because he may actually have been within his rights. But is that fair or is it just another form of street justice? That and many other debates coming up on this edition of RFL. But we begin tonight with President Obama's trip to One World Trade Center. Fios One reporter Tamani Woolley is in first position tonight. She joins us live from Manhattan with the very latest. Hi, Tamani. Good evening, Andrew. I'm here at the corner of Vesey and Church Street, right in front of World, One World Trade Center, where we have it that the president arrived at about 5.53 this evening. If you look behind me, you will see a throng of people looking to hope to get just a little bit of a glimpse of the president of the United States. While President Obama is inside, he'll be greeting workers. He'll also be signing one of the final beams that will be installed within the skyscraper. Now, we know that no presidential visit is key without some campaign financing. So after he leaves here, he's going to go downtown to the West Village, where he will be attending a fundraiser with Sarah Jessica Parker and her husband, Matthew Broderick, at their uh, town home down in the West Village. And then after that, it's another star-studded affair uh, at the Plaza Hotel, where he'll be doing a fundraiser where Mariah Carey will be performing. Now, we have it that the fundraiser for Sarah Jessica Parker is at $40,000 a plate, and the one later at, and they're expected to have about 50 people, the one at the Plaza Hotel is at about $10,000 a plate, which, considering, is a bargain, but uh, that's what on his plans right now after he leaves One World Trade Center. Again, he is inside the building greeting workers, signing one of the final beams that will be in the skyscraper. And I'm among a crowd of locals and tourists who are hoping to just get a sneak peek of President Barack Obama, who's also joined tonight by First Lady Michelle. That's the latest here at One World Trade Center. I'm Tamani Woolley. Andrew, back to you. And you'll have extended or continuing coverage for our viewers on Fios One as the evening progresses. Tamani Woolley live from the World Trade Center. Thanks very much, Tamani. Now, Manhattan, not the president's, the only locale on the president's agenda today. He gave a major speech on the economy in Cleveland, one that was advertised as a relaunch of his campaign. Now, this speech came just moments after Mitt Romney finished speaking down the road in Columbus, Ohio, as the two men dueled for support in that swing state and for control of the economic message. So, Ohio, over the next five months, this election will take many twists and many turns. He's doing that because he hasn't delivered a recovery for the economy. This election is about our economic future. Ask whether things are better. So who has the best vision for America's economic future, and will those messages that they're trying to espouse on the trail today stick in the minds of voters? To sound off on those questions and so many others, we are joined tonight by a fantastic panel. Jeannie Zeno, Dean and Professor of Political Science at Iona College, Dominic Carter, political journalist and author, and Basil Smeichel, a polit political strategist, a former top aide to Hillary Clinton, and a professor at Columbia University. And it was interesting listening to the messages uh, that, that came from the, the two candidates today. President Obama basically said, hey, you know what, we've tried the Bush tax cuts, hasn't led to more growth, and what Mitt Romney is pushing for is Bush plus more tax cuts. Is that an effective message? Does that get through the buzz when everybody's been saying President Obama's out of touch on the economy? <laughs> I, I, I think that the president, like I support the president, I'm a Democrat, loyal Democrat, I support the president, but he has a really, he has a problem. And his problem is messaging. We can argue about whether or not there has been a recovery, how big it's been, how small it's been, how many jobs are back on the table. He's got a big messaging problem because 
even if the economy is doing better, there are still a lot of people that don't believe him. And I spoke to a, a, an African American man yesterday, loyal Democrat, considers himself progressive, and he he ex is expressing doubts about the president. Does he think that Romney can do better? No. And I think there are a lot of folks that don't really believe that because it's not like Romney's articulating a better message, but they're concerned about the quality of the president's message and his ability to actually articulate his successes with the economy. Well, I think it's more than a messaging issue, I have to say. I mean, if his only problem is a messaging issue, why is unemployment up? I mean, his problem is not just a messaging issue. It's the fact that for the last three years, he hasn't done what he said he would do, which is recover this economy. You look at that speech, you know what he said? He said it's George Bush's fault. You look at what Romney said, he said it's it's Barack Obama's <coughs> fault. That's what they were saying today. But most of but the, the country the reality still blames George more, Bush. That's true. That new, new the new well, today, said that. Most of the country still blames George but Bush. But do they believe that Barack Obama has proven himself in the last three years to be able to bring this economy back? No. And Mar Mitt Romney is right to talk about that. And so, yeah, people still blame George Bush, but you know what? They'll blame Barack Obama. He's been in office for one term now. He's got to take some responsibility. This is more than just a messaging issue. They know it. If the economy, if unemployment doesn't go down, he is in big trouble. I couldn't agree more with what the perspective of each person that was said. Way to take a hard line. <laughs> no, 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 no. In other words, I'm trying to say you took my talking points because I, I do agree with Dr. Zeno that, see, o uh, President Obama's problem is that he pulled out 50,000 people to rallies and filled the stadium in Denver. People really bought into his message and thought that he was going to be a different president than what he sold us hope. And then he got to Washington and partisan politics smacked him in the face uh, in terms of gridlock. And so what I heard today from each of the, uh, the nominees was their talking points. Romney saying, look, this is all Obama's fault. But I do give the president this much credit. He made a compelling case today to say, to answer your question, uh, finally, he's starting to do this. Hey, this didn't start on my watch. This is a problem that began long before I became president of the and United I, and States. I, and you know what? I think one of the things that he needs to do, and I, and I agree with you, uh, one of the things that he needs to do to sort of blend what you said and the problem that I think he's having is um, even if I couldn't fix it fully, I at least put the brakes on it. Oh, please. Oh, boy. No, no, no. No, no, I'm stopping. No, no. He's been saying from day one, He's going to blame yes. George Bush. So for you to say that he just decided today to blame George Bush, he's been doing that right along. What he should but be he made doing. A compelling case today. Well, a yeah, very compelling it's case. an easy, compelling case to make. George Bush had some serious problems with the economy. I mean, he grew the budget in a way he shouldn't have done. I mean, you know, that's clear. What he should be doing is focusing on Mitt Romney's record as Massachusetts governor because that is not successful either. I mean, we have two people who have been in office who have not been successful fixing their economies. It's a very easy case to make. Instead, he's talking about. George Bush and this one is talking about Barack Obama. I want, want to jump ahead. One of the things that I found interesting is the difference between maybe what the reality on the ground is and what we're hearing in news reports as this campaign has shifted into the long summer month. We're seeing more and more headlines that, you know, they add a lot of drama to the campaign, but they may be a tad misleading about this race. I want to show you some recent headlines about the women's vote that we saw from uh, three different uh, places, from Bloomberg to lower women's votes. Obama turns to Lily Ledbetter. Uh, Romney makes inroads on Obama's advantage among women. Obama Obama Romney campaigns fight over women, but the latest poll that we have among female voters shows a 13-point lead for President Obama, probably not as grave as those headlines might lead you to believe. Same story on the Latino vote, if we shift ahead to those. Uh, headlines that say they're disillusioned by the president, that Obama's message to Latinos is complicated, or asking if he can, if, if Romney can win over the Latino vote. The black vote, black voters cooling to Obama, they're disappointed in the president. He's losing a stunning amount of support. But the latest poll numbers show the president with a 60-point advantage among black and Hispanic voters nationwide. And I'll go one more. Jewish voters. I saw a couple of headlines recently. Obama aims to shore up Jewish support. Mormons uh, strong behind Romney. Obama's Jewish support dips. Gallup, Obama's Jewish support slides. Though if you check the numbers, Gallup's poll still has the president with a 35-point lead among Jewish voters. Now, I realize these leads aren't as big as they were, let's say, in 2008 in the final numbers. But... 
are we getting a little misleading movement here from the press here? Are they throwing a little water on this thing to try to make, and, and we're guilty of this too, but to make things a little more dramatic as we head uh, into the long, the long, hot summer? The, the problem is in politics, perception often does become reality. Sure. And so whether it's legitimate or not, the point that you're making, Andrew, the, as long as the media continues to drive these stories along, the perception becomes reality. So with the Jewish vote, for example, uh, uh, the last six months, or I should say maybe the last year, we read reports that the president had so many troubles with the Jewish vote, especially because of the New York congressional race. Mm -hmm. But the numbers show different. But if the press continues to churn that type of story out, guess what? Perception becomes reality. Well, we we'll just encourage everybody to uh, do their own digging and don't take uh, the headlines for granted. Uh, be sure to dig into them and look. Also check the sources out, too.